Welcome now, summon. The cringe pagans are gonna like this one. So, although we make fun of some of these people in their Facebook groups who saw a crow and thinks that it's Odin trying to call upon them. Here, Facebook. At the same time, these people are not completely wrong, though. Connection and communication with birds have been an important part of the Norse spirituality, uh, but it happened at very specific times for very specific uh, reasons uh, to very specific people, okay? So in this video we're going over what the actual sources say uh, about bird speech and the Norse beliefs and even some very cool things that uh, us modern people can bring into our spirituality to help with this if they want to. So first, uh, we'll go over the mythological slash semi-mythological sources. Um, of course, these are the myths. Sometimes they are based on real historical figures, actually, uh, but they are not to be read like 100% historical events that really uh, happened. You'll see what I mean, uh, but by far the most famous of all of these is the Sigurd cycle poems in the Poetic Edda in Fafnismal is the main one. Uh, the Poetic Edda poem that's a, a dialogue that happens uh, between Sigurd after he kills the dragon uh, Fafnir, after killing the dragon or serpent, uh, Sigurd uh, tastes its blood, and Sigurd understands the speech of birds from that. And the birds nearby, there were seven birds, and the seven birds are telling him, warning him of Hryggen's betrayal. He was sitting right there next to him. Hryggen was planning on killing Sigurd, taking the treasure, and taking the Valkyrie, uh, Brynhildr. Uh, so the birds advise Sigurd uh, to take the treasure for himself, kill uh, Hjegen, and they tell him the way to get to the Valkyrie. This is the most famous uh, attestation of bird speech in the Norse text, and it's also in uh, Völsunga Saga, but it's portrayed there pretty much exactly the same, except it's six birds instead of seven. Uh, this is the key one. Of course, it's a fairy tale, but remember... Remember this aspect of drinking the dragon or serpent's blood and then being able to hear the bird speech after this because I'm gonna come back to that uh, in the last part of the video. Next, um, there's another story in this same kind of cycle of poems. Uh, this one is called Gudrun Akrida. Um, Gudrun gets the ability to understand the birds, but here it doesn't mention that she drinks the blood. Instead, she just uh, comes into possession of uh, Fafnir's heart, uh, which Sigurd uh, had. Another one, also in the Poetic Edda. The poem Rigsthula, it's a poem about the god Heimdall, uh, under the name of Rig in this source, and it tells us how he basically went out and created the three uh, classes, the three social classes of people. It's Thrall, Karl, and Jarl, uh, which are basically slaves, freemen, and chieftains, or nobles. And it says how basically he made, uh, he created those different classes of people based on the parents and how they treated him when he was a guest and uh, their hospitality. And he basically blessed the uh, Jarl uh, social class, the, the children there with the uh, special abilities. And, and once in history, uh, we fast forward a few generations, it is eventually the kings who are the, uh, the sons of the Jarls who are able to understand the speech of birds. So in this source it's even suggesting that all kings or maybe royalty have this ability as it suggests in other sources too. Uh, this source, uh, the king's name is actually Kundr um, in this poem and he has great abilities granted by Jig Heimdall and he was living his best life, enjoying his riches, enjoying all the luck and honor that came to him until one day he comes across a crow and the crow talks to him and the crow reminds him that he should not get too comfortable he should basically go to battle and acquire glory because guess what there are two other kings over here they are just as gifted as you but they have been fighting this whole time and they have more honor and glory than Kunr does this is one of my favorite poems because it reminds you to be hospitable first of all because you never know uh, who is going to be your guest it could be Heimdall trying to grant you with some 
from uh, blessings. And also, it doesn't matter how successful and great you become, never let yourself turn into a puss and not want to fight, okay? I think that's some great ancient knowledge that our modern leaders can take some wisdom from. But yeah, this text, uh, this poem is actually incomplete and we don't know much more in the story than that. But it's just another example of being able to understand birds. Another one comes in Helga Kvida Jörvarsonar, uh, here. Atli is the one who can understand birds. It's basically King Jörvarsonar. Um, he makes a vow to marry the most beautiful woman in the world, even though he already has four wives that are very beautiful. So he sends his messenger, Atli, and some of his men over to a woman called Sigrlin, a princess who was apparently the most beautiful woman in the world. Atli's men on the way there, they were all arguing about uh, who, who is the most beautiful woman on the planet, and they all think it's one of Hjordvaldir's uh, four wives, and one of them is already hottest, and he doesn't need another wife. But a bird overhears them arguing, and the bird speaks to Atli, and he says, No, Sigurdlin is in fact the hottest woman in the world, and Atli was actually the only one who could understand the bird, uh, not the other men. And Atli was not a king, uh, but he was a jarl, he was a noble, so he was in, still in that highest class of humans. And in this source, the bird actually... Uh, demands a sacrifice in return for the wisdom he gave. And this is just one of the reasons uh, why in the Norse uh, beliefs and practices, why we make sacrifices that are intended for the birds to take, uh, the Norse blutes. It's not that we're worshipping the birds, but the birds can be believed to be possessed by higher beings or even ancestors or gods. Uh, for example, in Skaldskapamal in the Prose Edda, the myth of the Mead of Poetry, Odin transforms into an eagle. Uh, in Inglinga Saga, it says that Odin has the ability to change into a bird, but also a snake or a fish. In the poem Thrymskvida, uh, Freya uh, lends her falcon cloak to uh, Loki, and they, they are both able to shapeshift into the form of falcon at, at times when they want. And then, of course, Odin's wife Frigg uh, is said to have Kyokuham, so the ability to shapeshift into a crow. So that's why the sacrifices we make, if you've seen my videos that I've done on that, they are ideally left to the birds. Um, and that is according to the folk tradition, too, coming from as recent as a couple hundred years ago. Then, next source, we have Ragnar's saga. Um, Ragnar's wife, Oslerg, who you all know from the TV show, she had the ability here to understand birds too. Apparently, she is uh, Sigurd's daughter, so that I just spoke about in the Völsung uh, cycle poems. Um, and Sigurd, we know, uh, could understand uh, speech of birds. Um, this is difficult because Sigurd and Oslerg and Ragnar, if they actually did exist, they would be separated by more than 300 years. But um, anyway, Oslerg, at least in this source, uh, learns from three birds um, and they tell her about uh, Ragnar's uh, deceitful plans to wed another woman behind her back. So if that all is true, this ability seems like it could be passed down uh, hereditarily uh, too. So you are born with this uh, gift to understand birds from your uh, parents. Uh, before I move on, uh, we'll speak about Odin quickly. Um, I'm not going to go over it all in this video, but a quick mention of Hugin and Munin, Odin's ravens. Of course, Odin is uh, attested in numerous sources to be able to understand his ravens when they fly out across the world and come back to him with news. Um, uh, those are the full mythological sources, really, and you know they are symbolic in nature. Odin's ravens. Hugin and Munin, what do their names mean? Thought and memory. Hmm. So what might they be symbolic of, okay? That's a very easy one there. Of course, they symbolize thought and memory. So I'll have to do a whole video on Odin and his ravens to show the understanding and, and the possible interpretation between, uh, behind those attestations. But, so I left that out of the video just uh, so you know. I'll cover that another time. But now we're going to go on to the real sagas. Um, now these are the sources that are generally believed to be the most accurate. 
They're unreliable for sure, um, with over-exaggerations and even flat-out lies, but the general history of uh, these sagas have been proven to be uh, of real historical events that happened. First is in Inglinga Saga, the first section of Heimskingla tells of a king named Dagr, who understands the language of birds, and uh, that was a very wise king because of this. He had a pet sparrow that would fly over vast lands and bring back wisdom to King Doggett. Uh, sounds very familiar to Odin and his ravens uh, in this source. We also have um, the poem from the uh, saga Fagashinna. It's a skaldic poem about the legendary Harald Fairhair, and it's a poem basically, uh, it's a conversation between a Valkyrie and a raven. The Valkyrie is asking the Raven about titled Fair Hair, and the Raven is basically answering questions and telling her about his deeds. So don't I won't go into the whole you know, poem in detail. Just want to mention that the Valkyrie here is listed um, uh, because she understands the Raven. It is because she's so wise and, and knowledgeable about that. So it does seem that um, it gives the idea that not everyone or not even every Valkyrie had this uh, ability to understand the bird speech. Uh, the Valkyries, you know, uh, they may not even be spiritual entities, actually. They might have been real women uh, sometimes. See my video I did on that here. Another source is in Gesta Danurum. Uh, there's a woman named Kraka, and she serves her son and stepson some dinner. Their names were Regnerus and Ericus, of course, Latinized versions of the name uh, Ragnar and Eric, uh, probably. Uh, there was a stew she served, and there were three snakes that she added to it, and they were hanging from above the pot, and their saliva basically dripping down into the uh, stew to make the liquid. Uh, Ericus is the one who eats this, and he gains the ability to understand animals. It doesn't mention birds specifically here, but I thought I'd include that. Another source is um, It's kinda, It is about King Olav III, and his men's encounter with a man named Kyoko Karl. So King Olav sends his men out, uh, out into the country and they come across a man named Kyokukard who can understand the birds. Uh, his name basically means crow, uh, crow earl or crow like nobleman, crow Carl. They brought this news back to King Olaf and he did not believe this at all. He just did not believe it. But one day he was sailing by this Kyoko car, this man's house, and he wanted to test it out. He wanted to find out if it was true. So he had his men go ask the old man, Hekaka, invite him out to the ship. I want to meet him, bring him out, like bring him out in a friendly way. And in secret, he would tell his men to uh, basically kill uh, Kyoko car's horse while he was out at uh, on the ship with them. So they all get out to the ship. They start rowing until three crows come along and they kind of start calling out to the old man and they tell him that the king's men are killing his horse and king olav was in shock at first um, but he did believe it at the end of the day and he ended up compensating the old man who understood the bird so this is the late viking age and here it even seems like and this was a christian king by the way so it seems like the idea and belief that someone could understand the birds that was disappearing, uh, whereas it was a much more common thing in the early Viking Age and, of course, the pre-Viking Age. That brings us to our next source, uh, Tacitus Germania. Um, another source that is basically a... A Roman historian writing about the Germanic tribes, writing about how they got sounds and signs for, uh, from the flight of birds. Also, you will see here that they had a custom of using horses for some sort of divination and religious practice. It goes into a lot more detail about horses here, but that's probably because the horses would be a bit out of the ordinary for a Roman seeing this thing. Whereas the Romans and the Greeks, they already had a tradition of using bird signs. Um, so that would have been not that different uh, to, from the Germanic people, so they felt a more need to uh, write about the horse type of divination spiritual practices, but I'm sure they had just as developed and complicated of a uh, culture around bird signs too. And these, like I said, were the Germanic tribes, and this is about seven 
800 years before the Viking Age. So different, uh, of course, but they were essentially the ancestors of the Norse and other Germanic peoples um, that would come in later on in time and the kind of proto-spiritual beliefs and religion of there. And even in other parts of Germanic Europe, later on continued with this belief. Um, one story from Anglo-Saxon England at a time where the uh, Anglo-Saxons were still pagan and they were slowly being Christianized there and the early 600s, the pagan king Edwin, who had recently become officially Christian at least, he was on his way to a battle and he saw a crow on the fence squawking and he stopped and he made the whole army stopped and, and said that they should wait and try and listen to see what the bird was saying. Uh, Bishop Palnius of York was with them. He was kind of like the Christianizer and guide of this king. And he didn't like it because he thought it was too pagan of a thing for the newly uh, Christian Saxons there to be doing. So the priest threw a rock at it, threw a rock at the bird, and he killed it. Uh, the Saxons lost the battle, by the way, so maybe the bird was trying to warn them. And yeah, this is just one of the many examples of bird speech and signs in the other Germanic sources around Europe. So yeah, this is not just a Germanic uh, tradition either, even though we might find those records a bit more in the Middle Ages of this happening, but we find myths about bird speech from all over, and probably the oldest and the most common in the Greek mythology, where there are numerous examples of gods giving a real human the gift to understand the bird speech. I'm not going to go over all of these, um, but uh, there's a couple stories here that are very similar to our Norse story, actually, of Sigurd, who gets the ability to understand the speech of birds and uh, by eating the serpent Fafnir's heart, remember. In uh, one Greek source, it mentions the seer. Uh, named Malampus. He was granted the ability to understand the speech of birds and other animals uh, when he was honoring two snakes um, that were killed by his servants by burning their bodies and he raised the snake's offspring and he got that ability when the baby snakes were licking his ears. In another source there was a Trojan uh, prophetess named Cassandra uh, supposedly acquired the gift of prophecy as a child when she was left out with her brother uh, in the temple of Apollo. Hollow. Uh, the next morning they were discovered with serpents coiled all around them and they were licking their ears again in that source. Another um, Greek philosopher in the 2nd century BC recorded that the Arabs gained an understanding of the language of animals through uh, eating the heart or the liver of a serpent actually and the certain peoples of India at the time attained knowledge of the language of animals by eating a dragon's heart or a dragon's liver um, just like Sigurd did in the Norse world. <clears throat> A final one, uh, Roman author Pliny the Elder uh, wrote that a Greek philosopher coming uh, uh, many, many years before him mentioned a process where you could take the blood of certain birds, mix two types of birds, mix it all together, and that would create a serpent in there. And the one who eats this gets the ability to understand the language of birds. So there you go all over the Indo-European tradition, really, from more than a thousand years before the Viking Age. And there was a belief somehow of eating a part of a serpent would grant you the ability to understand birds or animals. These, these ones that I went over are actually, by the way, considered very reliable uh, historical sources. They're not semi-mythological like, like the Norse ones I went over, but still you can see the similarities of course they're questionable are they true or not we don't know but at least the source is thought to be uh, historical to finish this and show you just how long this belief lasted um, and even some more tips if you want to you know try and understand these things yourself we can go over the folk tradition uh, in the sources in Scandinavia and these are from as little as one to two hundred years ago uh, first one in Jon Arneson's um, Icelandic folk tales and legends there were uh, some actual men in Iceland usually um, churchly figures that were documented to have understood bird language here's a list of a few of them uh, mostly uh, priests uh, one folk tale that we can find in Scandinavian folk belief and legend tells that you could boil a white snake and by drinking the water you would get three gifts. 
The first gift is wisdom. The second gift is um, like second sight, they call it. And then the third gift uh, is madness, which maybe you don't want. So yeah, we see this white snake too, by the way, come up in uh, other European folklore and, and other things like that around the world. Uh, a third one you can read about in Trildum. If you boiled a white snake and drank the water, it was supposed to uh, bring supernatural wisdom or, or uh, like they would call it, uh, becoming Trilkinni, uh, having that gift, that ability. Uh, it doesn't mention birds in any of these, but Guys, this is um, nothing different to the beliefs in all kinds of folk traditions around Europe and all over the world. In uh, Vendish belief, um, if a man ate a serpent, he could understand what the bird said. And in a uh, Syrian story from the Middle East, actually, um, if you drank the uh, serpent water uh, that, that it was boiled in, it enabled a person to understand the language of serpents and birds. And we even have some parallels to these beliefs in the uh, Swahili people, that area of Africa. So there's something there about eating a snake or drinking a water that it's boiled in and it's believed to give this ability. Believe it if you want, or not, but if you are going to do it, if you are going to try these things, definitely I would seek help of an expert. I'm not an expert, but I do have a bit more knowledge on these kind of types of things, but that's not really things I like to share out here on the open, but I've made two videos on Patreon about this already, but yeah, I can give you one more tip. If you want to try it out, because this source actually was written in an Icelandic magazine uh, a little over a hundred years ago. And that is that you could acquire the tongue of a kite bird, and you could soak it in honey, and you can place it under your tongue. Uh, or you could take the heart of a raven and put that in your mouth, and you would supposedly be able to understand birds. But it warns against this, because this could be deadly. And guys, never harm an animal. Unless you're going to eat it or use every part of it, I would never support unnecessary harming of an animal. And it can also be dangerous to eat, okay? First of all, snakes and birds, um, they have to be cooked properly or you can get very sick or even die. And second, if you pick the wrong one and you kill it and you cook it, there can be some very dire spiritual uh, consequences to that also, okay? There's a reason that humans have evolved over the thousands of years to be able to eat red meat raw but birds or reptiles uh humans never evolved that ability to eat raw we can get very sick we always have uh, gotten very sick from eating uh, birds or reptiles that meat is because those creatures are believed to be sometimes inhabited by certain other higher entities spirits, ancestors, and even gods, as the Norse sources have shown. So just disclaimer there. But that's all I have to say, the sources, and some extra little bonus info. But yeah, let us know if you guys have anything else, any similar beliefs from other places in the world. Uh, we would love to hear. That's why I make these videos, so we can all compare beliefs and really uncover the lost beliefs of our ancestors. So that's all for today. Thank you for watching. We see us next time.